Hi there, I'm Tom Spencer. This week, Central Texas Gardener pulls together native plants with an eye to wildlife in a preview of the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center's Gardens on Tour. So let's get growing right here, right now. Support for Central Texas Gardener comes from GeoGrowers, offering custom soil blends for lawns, gardens, xeriscaping, and organic landscaping supplies. More information at geogrowers.net. And also from The Planket, a plant covering designed to be lightweight, breathable, and water resistant to help keep plants warm and dry during harsh winter weather. Theplanket.com. You know, my favorite gardens reflect the dynamics of the changing seasons and the wildlife that favor them. Here's one that's on the top of the list. Lynn and Jim Weber, Texas Master Naturalists and National Wildlife Federation Habitat Stewards, are always on patrol to spy native and migratory wildlife at home or around town. In their garden, they look beyond spring romance with plants that nourish or harbor wildlife even in winter. Their book, Nature Watch Austin, tracks plant and wildlife activity in a monthly diary. Environmental awareness extends to their green-built home. But the yard, we focus totally on native plants and no turf grass so that we would have no ongoing maintenance and uh, so that we would need a little less water, fertilizer, pesticides. We get a lot more wildlife in the yard as a result. A lot of birds, butterflies, lizards, other insects, and Little animals uh, visit our yard, and we love having the opportunity to see them. That's more important to them than a desert of lawn. I think there's two reasons. I think one is it gives me a sense of place. The more I know about where I am, the more I feel at home there. And I think number two, it's a sense of wonder. And in its simplest terms, it makes me feel like a child again. To be able to discover something new, to see something I haven't seen before, or to notice something and really learn something more detailed about it. So it's, it's, like, it's like those carefree times when you were a child and you'd romp off into the woods or into a meadow or a field and, and everything was new. And I feel that way again here. When you have the plants, when you restore the ecosystem, when you have the diversity, you bring so much more to your yard and there's so much more for you to discover. It all started with their interest in birds. We had focused initially mostly on birds, and we had started getting interested in, in nature a few decades ago, more on birds. And, but as we saw a lot more, while you're out looking around, you see other things than birds. We saw butterflies, and then you start noticing uh, plants and the different uh, associations between butterflies and plants, whether it's for host plants or nectar sources. And, Pretty soon then uh, you start seeing other insects and uh, dragonflies and uh, you find lizards in the yard as well. Their backyard is huge. Bordering the Balcones Canyon lands, they're restoring the eight acre parcels native plants and adding new ones. It's been really an awesome thing for us. It's a good little canyon of diverse habitat. There's a perennial stream in there and uh, a good variety of native plants in there as well and golden cheek warblers on, the, on that piece. We've gone through and removed many, many, many non-native plants out of there, mostly ligustrum, but there's been, uh, there's a china berry and a few other things that we've taken out of there, but uh, we've spent many hours ridding it of non-native plants. The front yard is compact, but includes everything a diverse wildlife audience appreciates. In order to create a good wildscape, you have to have food, you have to have water, you have to have cover, and you have to have places to raise young. And I think the hardest of all those things, especially in Texas, is the water piece. So we knew that we wanted moving water. Moving water will attract a lot of wildlife just from the sound. Um, and we didn't have that naturally in our property, not many properties do, so we brought in a landscaper who specialized in water features. And that was Russell Womack, uh, Capital Landscaping. We put it in the front yard mainly because uh, we have kind of a difficult yard uh, from a slope point of view. And uh, 
it ended up being just a good use of the natural slope of the front yard to put one in, uh, in that location. There were some big stones there already uh, that could be featured around the water. And, and it's really nice to be able to see it while we're sitting in the study, to be able to have the view out the front window that's the water. And we have a lot of uh, birds and small animals that come to get a drink or take a bath during the day. That's another reason to diversify for every season. An ongoing cycle of flowers, berries, and seeds means a wider audience, since every creature has its favorite diet. The Webbers aren't the first to prune when winter changes the scenery. Well, the birds will appreciate the seeds out of the flower heads as they dry up. We like the look of the dried flowers as well as the, the new ones. And so we'll, we won't cut those back. Uh, and it's also good shelter for them. Uh, the, the bushes of the shrubby plants uh, being left up gives them a place to hide as they're coming in to get a drink of water. Everybody loves flowers, everybody loves things blooming, everybody loves spring, but you know you find that it, the other seasons have beauty too and you can learn a lot about the life cycle of plants, of insects, of other animals and you see that more when the seasons change and when your garden changes. We used to be so much more connected to those natural cycles. And now that we live in air conditioned and heated spaces, we miss out on that. And a changing garden brings that attention back in my life and I really enjoy it. Jim's attention led to photography to record their observations and to learn more about them. Unless you had caught it and you know looked at it under, you know, in hand basically, you're really not gonna see the detail you can get in the picture. And it only takes you know a second, and you've gotten an image that you can go study for hours so with you know three or four field guides and try to you know make sure you can tell exactly which one it is. And it's a good record in case it's something rare. Someone may want to know that you know where and when you saw this thing. The records inspired the book that started with a neighborhood newsletter to promote recognition and understanding of our fellow inhabitants. Our goal was that we wanted the people that lived in the neighborhood to appreciate some of what was going on in the Balcones Canyonland Preserve property that surrounds the neighborhood. So the idea of the, the newsletters was to pick a topic of something that might be happening in the neighborhood around that time of year. We wanted the people to appreciate what was around them and not be so focused on, gee, I heard a coyote or a word my, you know, a deer eating my flowers or, you know, the other kind of negative aspects to living next to a large preserve system. We run in the, run in the morning very early, Lynn and I, and we love when we hear a coyote or an owl in the morning while we're out running. It's just a, makes for a really good day. Although they've given their upfront garden structural design and tend it with timely maintenance, they allow it to be an active participant. Well, maybe that's just a reaction to most of our lives being so ordered that uh, maybe this is kind of a response to that subconsciously. You know, we've uh, let this be more freeform and natural, and, and it's sort of evolved every year. It's a little bit different. Some things do well. We decide we want to add or change things year to year, so it's been sort of a work in progress. And, and some of it is naturalized in its own way, and we just sort of let it kind of go in the direction it wants to go. And I think it, again, back gives you a sense of place, a sense of what works and what doesn't, and what the cycles are. And that's very enjoyable, very relaxing. It's a form of meditation in a way. What a beautiful space, and that is just one of six great local gardens that you'll be able to visit at the Wildflower Center's upcoming Mother's Day uh, weekend tour. This is a big event, uh, a much anticipated part of the annual calendar here for local gardeners, and joining us to talk about it is Andrea DeLong and Maya. Welcome back to the Hi, program. Hi, thanks for having me. It's always great to have you on the program to talk about the Wildflower Center's uh, garden tour. Uh, this is going to be a special one. They all are, mm -hmm. but uh, six great gardens for people to visit. Real quickly, let's give people the lay of the land. How does the tour work? Yeah, so it's going to be the Saturday before Mother's Day. Will be open. All the gardens will be open from nine to five, and it's a self-guided tour. And you can just you can get the addresses from our website. Mm -hmm. uh, you can also purchase tickets in advance at uh, various garden centers. Um, and then you just drive around, you know, get your hat and sunscreen and bottles of water, and 
Check out the gardens, they're beautiful. Well, the one we yeah. just saw certainly is beautiful. Uh, very relaxing looking. I love all the water features. And a great plant collection. Okay. They have an amazing collection. Well, there are a bunch of others that we want to talk about, and we're going to just refer to them by street names so people can, uh, when they may want to make note of that as they plan their, uh, their routes. The first garden we're going to talk about, I was struck by this one as like, uh, is this Stonehenge in Austin? <laughs> this is on Ridgecrest. Yes. And uh, sculpture plays a prominent part in this garden. Very fun, very interesting. And this is the largest of our gardens that we have on the tour this year. Mm -hmm. And uh, the idea here is really, it's a, it's a fairly new installation, but the, uh, the homeowners really wanted to have a, a nice garden to display their sculptures. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting. There's beautiful natural stone mm -hmm. um, that is arranged in different artistic ways and uh, interesting little spaces as you tour around the garden. Well, I was a really, you know, and, and these are sculptures collected from all around the world world, but they mm -hmm. have a very naturalistic kind of look to mm -hmm, them, mm -hmm. and including the Stonehenge. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't want to be the person mowing that lawn, though. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get close to Stonehenge. Yeah. It's like, that's okay. Right. But in a, it looks like it'd be a lot of fun to visit, and the plantings are uh, all natives, or a, a well, good yeah, proportion. Well, yeah, a good proportion are, yeah. yeah mm -hmm. Which is obviously the case with the, the Wildflower Center's tour. You really want to highlight gardens to make good utilization of the native plant Absolutely. materials, right? Yes. So that one looks like a lot of fun and should make for great photography. Yes. <laughs> uh, now on Shadow Mountain, um, this is one that's described as an oasis of trees. Yes, if you're looking for ideas for a shady garden, this is definitely one you want to see. Mm -hmm. um, it's also a fairly small garden. It's maybe a medium-sized garden. Um, and this uh, a lot of native plants, it's a high percentage, mm -hmm. and uh, it has nice trails that go through the property even though it's a fairly small place. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a wildlife habitat, wildlife certified, which is also cool. Mm -hmm. Well, this is one that I would be very interested in because now I'm dealing with a lot of understory kinds mm. of situations. A lot of people have that. Yeah. Right, and, but, and, but you know, uh, because you have shade doesn't mean it, you can't use the natives. A lot of people think right. it's all, those are all the, the, you know, the cactuses and the yuccas and the agaves. That live, Good point, you know, yeah. But they're not. Uh, there are they're a lot all, of understory plants that mm -hmm. do really well, native plants that do really yeah. well. And I'm sure this garden will feature many of those and it looks like a great spot to visit. So I hope people will avail themselves of that opportunity. That one again is on Shadow Mountain. Mm -hmm. um, the next one has, uh, I love, uh, you always seem to find some on the, a garden tour that have that touch of whimsy. And there's <laughs> a, certainly that in some of the sculptures that this one, this is Zadok Woods. Mm -hmm. And this is a lot of native plantings interspersed with some cool sculpture. And this is one of the smallest gardens that we have. So uh, every year we have people that really appreciate seeing the smaller gardens. So we're going to yeah. have actually a higher percentage of small gardens on this year's tour. So you can get an idea of, you know, what can you do with a small space and mm -hmm. really maximize the use of it. Um, beautiful border gardens, lots of nice little sitting areas. Um, you know, it's a very lush garden in addition to the whimsy and the sculpture that they mm -hmm. have in there. It's very cute. Well, scale is real important, and you can have big impact in a mm -hmm. small space. And people, you know, it doesn't have to be a grand villa. -esque. Absolutely, <laughs> it's a of, lot less maintenance too. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> so th there's there's a lot of wisdom in having a small <laughs> that's garden. True. That's something I've learned as I've gotten older. I think mm -hmm. uh, my back appreciates uh, smaller Your gardens. Back does, right. <laughs> so, but uh, anyway, that one is Zadok Woods. The next one uh, is on uh, Bree Court. It's called Bree Court Manor, I think mm -hmm. is what the name of the street is. Yeah, and those are both uh, fairly close to the Wildflower Center okay, in the Circle great. C area. And that's another fairly small garden. Mm -hmm. um, and that's right up against the Green Belt. And so the garden is designed to take use of that beautiful view of the Green Belt, okay. which is nice. Kind of blend, naturally blend mm -hmm. into that. They have a fence that you can see through. Mm -hmm. And um, and that also has uh, features a lot of nice seating areas outdoors. Again, mm -hmm. in a small space, just how you can use that space to really use it as a living place yeah. to extend your house, basically. Right. And this one has a beautiful covered seating area mm -hmm. out in the middle of the garden, which I think in Texas is so smart. Yeah, there's a covered seating area, and then there's an open area around a fire pit. So depending mm. on the weather, you can have a nice, comfortable place to sit. Right, right. So if you don't have the shade, build it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> or plant it, <laughs> exactly. right? Exactly. So uh, again, uh, for those people, and I, I know that many people in some of the newer subdivisions that have those natural landscapes that they back into, it's so odd to me to see like this tightly manicured Santa Augustine lawn abutting this beautiful natural space. Mm -hmm. And so why not try to blend it all in together, sure, right? Sure. 
And then uh, finally, of course, uh, we have the Wildflower Center itself, mm -hmm. which is, I understand from all, everybody who's been down there this year that it is looking really spectacular. I have to say, I think it's probably having its best year so far. Yeah. Every year it gets better. Uh, and this year, um, we're featuring, we're going to be opening up our new Texas Arboretum, which will have a grand opening on May 19th. So we encourage everybody to come and mm -hmm. check that out because that's a huge 16-acre Arboretum that we've done. Well, and the, to me, I'm a tree guy. All oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Woody plants, that's where I am. I really love the trees. I am really excited about this, good, too. Good, good. You know. I can yes. only imagine the number of different species of oak, for example, that you might have We have there. a lot of things. And then the gardens themselves are looking great. You mm -hmm. know, one of the gardens that we installed last spring, the Texas Mixed Border, is also looking really great. And it's a small space, so right. again, for people looking for ideas for a small garden. And we have an out. image of that. that. This is really quite a stunning looking space. And I know you had a big hand in this, so mm -hmm. you know the plants rather intimately in here. Mm -hmm. But it's it's not just the flowers that are working here, the foliage, everything really Yeah, seems lots of to textures and forms and it really tried to make it feel more residential with the seating areas and the, mm -hmm. the benches and the bird bath and all that. And there's one other image we have and uh, uh, that it looks like a lot you, there's a lot of play on geometry in the, in the Wildflower mm -hmm. Center gardens and people I think that sometimes takes people su by surprise because you expect this very natural landscape. Meadows. But, but my, mm -hmm. one of my favorite parts of the garden is that geometric grid towards the back of the garden. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you've inserted circles into the squares, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> which Geometry I really like. Them. Good, yes. Yeah, those tank gardens are a lot of fun because they mimic or reflect the uh, ranching architecture of the Wildflower Center, and they're easy to garden, and they're elevated off the ground. Right, right. Well, I, it, it all looks terrific. Good, and I know people you. will really enjoy themselves. So let's go over the basics just one more time mm -hmm. to make sure everybody has the information. The perfect thing for mom, because mm -hmm. it's the day before Mother's Day, and so people will know that, that, that when Mother's Day approaches, check out the Wildflower Come Center website. Come to the website. Wildflower Center tour. Yeah, check out the website. Again, it's going to be uh, the Saturday before Mother's Day, uh, May 12th, and that will be from 9 to 5. Mm -hmm. And we have five private gardens plus the Wildflower Center uh, for people to visit. Okay, now sometimes the tickets are available at nurseries or mm -hmm. they, uh, is that happening yeah, this year? Yeah, and the nurseries that we're that are going to be selling the tickets, we have, let's see if I can remember everybody, Barton yeah. Springs, All right. uh, Treehouse, um, Shoal Creek, uh, of course the Wildflower Center mm -hmm. store. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'm forgetting one more. The uh, website will <laughs> Thank help Thank you, out. yes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's a pleasure to have you, as always, join us. It looks like a Thank great uh, selection, so thanks very much for it's being gonna here. It's going to be a fun tour. I'm sure it will be, and coming up next is our friend Daphne. Hi, I'm Daphne Richards, and this is Augie, CTG's resident doggy horticulturist. Our question of the week comes from Joy, who wants to know what's happening to her wine cups. The plant is decaying from the center outwards, and the leaves turn yellow and have bumps on the undersides. And right after we received this question, I noticed that the wine cups in the garden in front of my office are doing the same thing. We have a huge patch of them, about four feet in diameter, and death is slowly radiating from the center, ever closer to the edges of the plant. Joy suspects that she has rust, and we thought she might be right. But rust or not, we knew that this was most likely caused by some th sort of microbial pathogen, so we consulted my good friend Dr. Kevin Ong, extension plant pathologist from the Texas Plant Disease Diagnostic Lab. Well, Joy, great detective work. Dr. Ong confirmed that your initial research led you to believe rust, and he says that seeing reports of lots of it this year. Now for the not-so-great news. Unfortunately, there really isn't much to be done for the plant at this point. Fungicides may be successfully used on rust in many cases, but here, with the entire center of the plant already dead, you won't be able to reverse the damage, so you needn't bother with any treatment. This disease is likely a little more prevalent this year due to the fact that we had a relatively warm winter with better than average rainfall, and our spring temperatures warmed up very early. Because of this, our wildflowers came on early and strong, and microbes took advantage of the warmer, wetter than normal environment. I would suggest allowing the plant to flower until it becomes more unsightly than you can bear. Then cut the top growth back. Wine cups are perennials, so they should grow back from their underground tuber if it hasn't been damaged by staying overly wet. Wine cups prefer dry, rocky, very well-drained soil. So if you have organic mulch around them, be sure to remove it or at least push it back from the center. After you've cut the plants back, clean up any organic matter, including any mulch that you had around the plant. Rusts are very host-specific, 
meaning that each species of rust usually only attacks a couple of specific plants, so the rust on your wine cups most likely won't damage the other plants in your garden. Dr. Ong also pointed out that the rust was most likely only the initial pathogen here. After it did some initial damage, other pathogens most likely moved in to take advantage of the weakened plant. So be sure to remove all of the possible source of the pathogenic spores that you can and toss it in the garbage. Our plant of the week is Celosia spectata, flamingo feather, sometimes called wheat straw celosia. We've long admired this warm winter annual in the east side patch garden of Philip Leverage where it readily sows itself in sunny, decomposed granite paths. Philip notes that celosias prefer a well-drained, greedy soil. In fact, they're prone to root rot if kept too wet. At the same time, even though they love the heat, they do require supplemental water in drought. These are showy plants that get two to two and a half feet tall and about 14 inches wide. The vibrant pink flowers are great for dried arrangements and you can collect the seed to plant again next year. Plant seeds after the last frost to enjoy until the first freeze. Philip harvests seeds from his plants when they mature in November or December. At that time, he plants them where he wants to see them next year or you can save your seeds in a container to set out next spring. To do this week, collect seeds from your spring flowers if the seed heads are brown. We'd love to hear from you. Please visit klru.org ctg to send us your questions or a plant of the week from your garden. Thanks, Daphne. Now let's check in with John Dromgel for Backyard Basics. Hello gardening friends, welcome to Backyard Basics. We'll talk a little bit about mulch today. You know, we're all using more and more mulch. After last year, with that drought and that heat, we need to change the way we garden. So we're eliminating our lawns, that's for darn sure. That's enough water on the lawn wasted out there. So we're looking for other ways of um, making our landscape look nice and reducing all of that water we've been using all over the state. It's been the same thing everywhere. And so I'd like to show you some types of mulches that um, I like to recommend and um, maybe they're available in your area also. Here's one right here. This is compost. You can make it at home. You can go out and buy it in bulk or you can uh, find it bagged at the different garden centers. Um, Compost feeds the soil. It's one of the best things to feed the soil. And um, it just brings life to that soil also. Very, very important to have a nice, living, healthy soil. And one of the main things that does that is compost. Here's the Texas native mulch. Now this is something that uh, you could use at home. It's very nice. Uh, it is a um, grinding of the um, cedar trees and oaks. When they're clearing the land around here and all over the state, they have this leftover wood. So they recycle it. And um, the way they do that is to just put it in big piles and grind it a couple of times. It's not really composted, but it does, while it's in that pile, pick up some color. So that's what you see right there is a uh, rich color than normal wood. For example, this is the shredded hardwood right here. Same thing. Hasn't been um, piled up very long, but it has been shredded recently. This is not a bad looking commercial um, type of uh, mulch. It's um, inexpensive too. If you're looking to save a little bit of money, this type of mulch has got to be one of the least expensive. Here's another one right here. I think this is a very important one right here because it takes some science behind it to make something that would be on the forest floor. And so um, on the forest floor, you'd find some compost out there. You'd find some organic matter, leaves and branches, maybe a bird died. All of this organic matter has fallen to the soil and slowly decomposed. That's the best compost of them all. This one right here is a nice blend, and if you got down on your knees in the forest, this is what you'd see right here. This blend of compost and mulching type material, wood material. When those two get together and they start to grow, you develop a fungal mat that belongs there in the soil. It makes the soil healthier, brings back nutrients as necessary, and it's the way these plants grow in nature. Next time you're in the forest, dig a little bit and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Here's another one right here, and uh, this one is pine straw. Pine straw is a wonderful mulch. I use it in the vegetable garden very frequently, every year really, and around roses. It's attractive when it's on the ground, and um, it slowly breaks down over a couple of 
of seasons. It doesn't change the pH rather quickly, it does it rather slowly. But as it does it, you change the pH of the soil and that means we have a healthier soil out there. This is decomposed granite. We use it for walkways and other special places in the landscape. It's a southwestern look when it's used out there. Can be blended with your soil, opens the soil up nicely. And finally, finally this is um, one of the rock type mulches. There are several sizes and a lot of people are using them. The only problem with this type of mulch is it gets very, very hot during the day and as a result at night it re-radiates that heat. That's very uncomfortable and not the best thing for the home landscape to get more heat. So there you have it, a little look at some of the types of um, mulches that you can find or make yourself like some of the compost. I hope that you enjoy your garden and maybe you'll select some of these types of mulches to improve the soil and have hardier plants. For Backyard Basics, I'm John Dromgul. I'll see you next time. Watch online and find out more at klru.org slash ctg. Next week, we grow up with gourds. Until then, I'll see you in the garden. To learn about today's program, watch online and follow CTG's blog, check out klru.org slash ctg. Support for Central Texas Gardener comes from GeoGrowers, offering custom soil blends for lawns, gardens, xeriscaping, and organic landscaping supplies. More information at geogrowers.net. And also from The Planket, a plant covering designed to be lightweight, breathable, and water resistant to help keep plants warm and dry during harsh winter weather. Theplanket.com.